Good evening, and welcome to another episode of the Author Showcase Series, a virtual experience of the South Florida Writers Association, a nonprofit organization supporting writers and the literary arts. My name is Evelyn Benson, host and producer of this digital marketing program, which is a benefit for the members of the association. Tonight, I am thrilled to introduce author Regine Rayevsky Fisher, who is not only an author, but also a versatile and accomplished writer, musician, composer, performer, piano and voice teacher. She will discuss her two books, Dance Me to the End of Love, Volumes 1 and 2, which are collections of short stories. Author Regine was born in Moscow, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, where she received the equivalent of a Bachelor of Arts degrees in both music and literature. She immigrated to the United States of America entered Columbia University's School of the Arts writing program and received her MFA in 1993. She began to write in English in the late 1980s and has written plays, poetry, song lyrics, and short stories. She also taught piano, voice, and Russian language and literature including most recently at the University of Miami. Regine has been published in various literary magazines, and one of her short stories won an award from Columbia University that led to her reading it at the KGB Club in downtown New York. The Editor's Choice Award was also presented to Regine for Outstanding Achievement in Poetry, by Poetry.com and the International Library of Poetry 2000. She lives in Miami with her husband, Wesley, who will be reading a part of her collection, children, and a small dog named Gemma. Visit her website, reginefisher.com, for more information. So fellow writers and readers, Put your hands together for author Regine Rayevsky Fisher. Hello, everyone. My name is Regine Rayevsky Fisher. Today, I'm going to talk about my book, Dance Me to the End of Love, that was recently published. But before I do that, I would like to thank the South Florida Writers Association for giving me this opportunity to present the book to other writers. Big thanks to my editor, my publisher, my writing group, my friends, my family, including my grandson, Sam, and my dog, Gemma. Just a little bit more about myself. I came to the United States as a Soviet immigrant in 1978 under the agreement between Brezhnev and Jimmy Carter. Carter said, give me your juice and I will give you grain. Brezhnev thought it was fair. That's how Jewish immigration from the Soviet Union started. I came to New York City with my four-year-old son and fell in love with it. We both did. I didn't speak English at the time. It took my son two weeks to speak the language. It took me years. After marrying my now husband, we moved to Princeton into John O'Hara's former house. I happened to know who John O'Hara was since he had been translated into Russian and I knew his work. Somehow I got the urge to write as if his ghost handed me a pen. And that's how my first story was written. Surprisingly, it got published, Beginner's Luck. That prompted me to write a few more. 
all of which I sent to Columbia University School of the Arts writing program. I was accepted and received a master's degree in writing in 1993. That's how my literary journey began. I since have written plays, stories, poems, lyrics for songs. Five years ago, we moved to Miami and I am very grateful for the fact that I found fantastic people with the same interest that helped me to keep on writing. Dance Me to the End of Love is a collection of short stories in two volumes. I came to write short stories partly because I was brought up in Moscow on reading the short stories of Chekhov, Nabokov, Turgenev, Gogol, as well as O. Henry, Hemingway, O'Hara, Borges, Marquez, and others in translation. After being introduced to Raymond Carver, Flannery O'Connor, Eudora Welty, and other Southern writers, I wished to follow their tradition. I like the genre because it suits my temperament. I like to go to the source of things quickly. Being also a musician, I try to bring music into my stories. I hope readers will enjoy these stories and find connections to some of the characters. It's all fiction based on my experiences and observation of life. I love to study human nature and how humans behave under different circumstances. Many of my stories have no definite ending, as if even though we have finished reading them, the stories and the characters continue on. In the beginning of the book, there is a dedication to my mother that I would like to read to you. To memory of my mother, Waiting for my mother's arrival is my earliest memory. I have asked my mother many times where it took place and described the countryside, myself in a carriage near a lake, my grandmother's face close to my as she laughs. Soon mama will come. Do you hear how the train is coming? How it's bringing your mama? And then soon my mother's aroma as if through a stream of warm air and an enormous bar of chocolate that had melted in her pocketbook during the long journey to us at the dacha. I am flooded with the memory of her running to the lake, holding the chocolate, her familiar face, large white teeth, the puffed sleeves of her dress that fit her figure so well, the taste of the melted chocolate. Where did this all take place, Mama? How old was I? Her answer was the squinting of her eyes she always made when she wanted to remember something, her look into space. She was not sure, but I remember that round bl blue lake and tall pines and myself in a carriage, though not anything else, only the moment of joy in waiting for her. I have always felt myself and my mother and my grandmother and everyone else related to me as parts of each other. And together we comprised a part of something big that had neither form nor limit nor end. Today, um, I will read to you two stories from volume one. Uh, first, nine is, uh, first one is the um, Consolation Prize that takes place in Moscow. And the second one is called Reading Proust that takes place in Philadelphia and will be read by my husband because it's from the male point of view. Here we go, Consolation Prize. As was her ritual, on the way to her piano lesson, Emma wandered into the most prestigious pastry shop 
on Gorky Street in the center of Moscow to look at chocolate crispy magic wrapped in a magnificent gold, silver, pink, blue or green shiny paper that seemed also to produce the sound of a slight whistle upon unwrapping that called you somewhere. The wondrous waffle stick cost one ruble. Emma had five that her mama had been giving her to pay for her private piano lessons that would prepare her for a very hard admissions examination to the very reputable Gnesin Music School. On the rare occasion, when mama accompanied her to the lesson to discuss with the teacher Emma's progress, if praised, Mama would take her to the coveted store on the way home and buy one silver stick for Emma, never for herself, since money was very tight in their family. Emma would always give Mama a bite to taste the magic, and Mama would acknowledge that it was heavenly. But today, Emma was distracted and walked quickly out of the store. Today, she would play three fantastic dances by Shostakovich. It was a set of miniatures in a style of music that Emma had never heard or played before. Its unusual harmonic features were haunting her. When Emma's teacher had suggested that she give it a try, he added, Dmitri wrote it at exactly your age, 16 when he was still a student at Petrograd Conservatory. He was on the brink of self-discovery. For some reason, the teacher had looked at Emma pointedly and she felt proud. At home, Emma had looked at the music sheet and started to figure out how to play it. She got excited. Even though it was modeled after traditional dances, minuet, waltz and polka, the music was exceptionally non-traditional and humorous. It was so well crafted, Emma found it easy to lose herself in it. She practiced for hours. Today, she skipped down Gorky Street, a long stretch from the Belarusian train station to Red Square with its famous red star on Spassky Tower the round clock which sounded every hour for the whole country as if saying we're not sleeping here we're watching you emma remembered how her teacher had awkwardly given her that sheet music don't lose it it's precious you won't find it in any music store what's a big deal emma had asked her mama when she had returned home you see her mother whispered Shostakovich is not well liked by the authorities because he tends to step over the line. He's not like everyone else. You will hear it in his music. And he wasn't. Emma understood that from the first bars of his music that she played. And she had fallen in love with the dances. She had worked hard on them, suspecting that this music was also important for her teacher. Today, she would play it for him. She continued down Gorky Street, glancing at the windows of specialty shops. Nothing new or exciting was displayed there. Cheap plastic handbags, scarves with Russian folk designs, unfashionable dresses in gloomy colors, and other uninteresting garbage. All of a sudden, Emma stopped. Oh my God, it cannot be my dream. It only happens in fairy tales. In one of the store window displays, she suddenly stopped as long, up to the elbow, black silky gloves almost reached out to her. They shone invitingly, as if promising a different life in a different world at a different time. Emma, who had only a school uniform, and a dress that her mother had managed to sew for her to wear after school and on Sundays, in her mind was creating all sorts of outfits for herself and her friends. The main attributes of all her creations 
consistently wore long gloves. Once she had seen in an American trophy movie about an opera singer, everything that the gorgeous actress wore, she wore with long gloves and they had caught Emma's attention as the main accessory that a woman should have. In the window, next to the gloves, the price tag was visible, five rubles. Emma's heart started jumping up and down. She thought she might have a heart attack. She walked into the store. There was just one woman ahead of her at the counter and she was trying on the gloves. They were exactly like the ones in the movie. They promised beauty, success, love, happiness, everything. While the customer was talking to the salesperson, Emma decided on a plan of action. She would pay for the gloves with the five rubles her mama had given her for the piano lesson. And she would skip the lesson, would call the teacher and say that she was sick. The plan was perfect and came to her in a matter of seconds. Emma closed her eyes for a moment and heard the salesperson addressing her. And you, young lady, what would you like? Emma opened her eyes and slowly pronounced gloves. The word had a taste of smooth chocolate in her mouth. What gloves? The salesperson's surprise voice reached Emma's ear. The black silky long gloves that you display in the window. Here is five rubles. Emma extended her hand with a crumpled five ruble bill in it. Oh, those just sold the last pair. Emma wasn't aware of how long it took to reach her teacher's house. An eternity, a few seconds, she was indifferent to the world around her. As soon as she arrived, she gave her teacher the five rubles and went directly to the piano. She noticed that there was someone else in the room and usually she did not like to play with another student or another adult present, but this time she felt nothing. The world was unfair, cruel, and as far as she was concerned, if she died tomorrow, she could not care less. As unusual, she went as I'm sorry, as usual, she went through her scales and arpeggios, but somehow this time they sounded cleaner and better than ever before. The fear of failure left her. She was at the bottom and the only way out was up. She was not afraid of anything. Next. She played Mozart's sonata in G, to which she applied a different tempo, presto, instead of allegro. Previously, she thought she would not be able to do it. Her teacher was saying something that she did not hear. She looked at him. He was smiling. Oh, well, she thought, I must have done something right. Just before she started playing the three fantastic dances, she remembered how in the very beginning, her teacher had told her about economy of motion and how to place the thumb in the middle of the white key. Otherwise, it would result in a forward and backward movement that would make piano playing look very difficult instead of effortless. Put the thumb at about a 30 degree angle. You gain more control of arm weight which in turn controls the fingers and the wrist position. Don't swing your elbows. Keep them close to your torso. Shoulders relaxed and down. Practice a lot of arpeggios. Practice octaves by playing Chopin and Debussy. Play octaves with straight fingers. Love it. The music is there. All you have to do is to bring it out. After the lesson was over, at the front door, her teacher said, it was wonderful. You outdid yourself. The teacher nodded towards the room with the piano where the stranger was sitting. He loved it. You should be proud of yourself. Who is he? 
Emma shrugged her shoulders. Shostakovich. When Emma stepped out onto the street, a long finger of silken sunlight enveloped her whole being in a soft blanket of peace. And uh, the second story that takes place in Philadelphia is going to be read by my husband, Wesley. Please. Reading Proust by Regine Rajewski Fisher. My wife died two years ago. Tormented with grief, I've been reluctant to adjust to my new life in the suburbs of Philadelphia that did not make sense anymore. But two years later, whatever was still available in 65-year-old me started twinkling at the ages. Sad still, but with slowly growing attention to the outside world, I became ready for my personal evolution. And when David, a friend of mine, invited me over for a light supper or early dinner or a glass of wine or a conversation, he appended a murky agenda to his invitation, I went. Sure enough, even though it was not skillfully done, he attempted a banal matchmaking. There was a woman at his place. Adele, she said, as soon as I entered the apartment. David introduced me as Robert, though I preferred Rob, but I did not want to mess up his scenario, so I kept silent. David spotlighted a perfect arrangement of wine and cheese and nuts, crackers of different kinds, green olives, candles that submerged the room with its inhabitants into a semi-darkness in which Adele was still seen perfectly clearly due to the fact that she was draped in white clothes. The night before, I did not sleep. I was reading An Amour de Soin, the first volume in Proust's great novel A la recherche du temps perdu in the original French. I read slowly, sometimes with my attention on every word, every paragraph, every thought. Other times my mind wandered into those most impenetrable parts of myself, trying to unlock them. Adele was lovely, and I could have struck up at least a friendship with her. She had turned 59 last month, I was informed, but I did not believe her. I knew very well how strongly women hold on to that last nine. When they turn 30, they are still 29 for the next several years. When they turn 40, they become 39, until they are 50, and so on. After all, I've been around. I've read Proust and others. I've had girlfriends. I have been married. But Adele was quite nice. A bit bossy, a bit steamy, a bit chaotic, but not bitter like many others at her age. Widowed just like me. We immediately struck up a conversation in which we touched upon travels, exhibitions, ballet performances. David joined in, but tentatively, so as not to steal the show. Sometime later, he offered us coffee and put out a plate with Madeleine cookies, which gave me an opening to recite. No sooner had the warm liquid mixed with the crumbs touched my palate than a shudder run through me. An exquisite pleasure had invaded my senses, with no suggestion of its origin. That was all I remembered from Proust's novel, but it was enough to leave Adele awestruck. We left David's place together, and after I put Adele into a taxi, she lived in Center City, I walked home very full of myself, thinking that I deserved better than her, that at least I should play the field to see what, out, what is out there before settling with any new woman. Mysteriously, the very next day, a group of friends informed me that they were going to plant a place in the city that was a scene, and they wanted me to meet them there. I was ready, I told myself. I had heard that plant was a blend of a bar and a meeting place for singles, full of motion, noise, suits, and young women. I met my friends inside. They were standing at the bar, a little drunk, saying that I should order doubles to catch up with them. So I ordered a whiskey and soda, even though I wasn't a suit type, but more artistic bar bohemian, I imagined, in my tweed jacket, no tie, and a pink shirt. My friends were having a good time drinking, talking loudly, while glancing at a group of gorgeously clueless 25 or so year old girls. One of our group picked up his drink and saying, I'm heading towards the dessert, walked over to the bubbly swans and scanty dresses and strappy sandals. Five minutes later, he returned. So, I said. Without looking at me, he said, I got the brush off for no reason I could think of. I was polite and complimentary. What did you say, I asked. I said to one of them, you have spectacular breasts. He ordered another drink. I told him he should not have made direct statements. You should have said you have beautiful eyes, you moron. How old are you? Has life taught you nothing? Don't you know any better? For some reason, I became a little angry. 
Well, if you're so smart, you go. Go and show us how it's done. The thing was that all these high expectations of my expert performance made me less and less sure of myself. So I finished my drink, put money on the counter, and said to the three of them, I would, losers, but I have a terrible headache and have to go take care of that, perhaps next time. As I began to make my way towards the exit, a young girl from the group of swans caught up with me and said, are you leaving already? Did you have a good time? Now that was a good opening line, and I stopped and smiled at her glorious young self. What's your name? I asked innocently. You look like someone I've seen before, maybe in the movies? She stepped closer to me. And you look like a soccer player, aren't you? As a matter of fact, never mind, this summer is so hot, I'd love to be in the Hamptons. The Hamptons, my very own place. I usually spend my summers there. I didn't tell her that I have friends there who put me up from time to time. By now she was stroking my arm. How do you get there? It's seven hours drive from Philadelphia. Oh, my delicate flower, I said, smiling. I fly. You like flying? Oh, yes, I do, particularly on private jets. What else do you like? Do you like books, movies, music? She was giggling, leaning her breasts closer to me. I started feeling much better. I looked back and realized that my friends were staring at us, the two of us in bewilderment. Oh, God, I thought. Proust, how boring, depressive. Now, this is fun. By the way, my name is Isabella, and I like music. What kind, I asked, thinking where I should take her next. Rock and roll, she said. Hmm, I said, me too. What band do you like? Excitedly, she replied, Nirvana and the Smashing Pumpkins and Radiohead, and I had no idea whom she was talking about. But nodding my head in agreement, I finally said, do you like the Beatles? Wings? Beatles? I like the Beatles. Who do you like the most of them? I felt a bit delirious, gazing at the low opening of her dress, showing her cleavage that was coming at me. I don't know, Isabella furrowed her eyebrows. Maybe Paul, I suggested. Paul who? Paul McCartney. Is he a Beatle? Suddenly I was overtaken by a desire to break free of this 20-something ignoramus, understanding that it was not her fault. The room became unsettling with humidity, and I decided that it would be much wiser for me to go home to my Proust and maybe to call Adele. Sorry, sweetheart, I said to Isabel, but I just remembered I, I have to be somewhere right now. I will call you later. I never asked for her number. With increasing speed, I exited the place. And that will be it for today. Uh, I thank you very much for listening. Uh, you could purchase these books at Amazon Books and Books, Barnes and Noble, I believe that's it. And I wish you the very good day, week, month, year, life. Bye.